Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Movies That Pop. I'm the Colonel. Let's see what popped up in theaters this week. If you think a movie can't be a heartwarming coming-of-age story whilst simultaneously being a terrifying monster movie that scares you right out of your bones, then brother, you ain't seen it. Based on Stephen King's classic and I'd even go so far as to call it his masterpiece. I mean, the point can be made for The Stand or the Seven Book Dark Tower series if you really want to split hairs, but the novel, It, which features a huge cast of characters and follows them over decades as they face off with a nameless evil which lives and thrives beneath a small main town, has been adapted into the first of what I can only imagine will ultimately be two very satisfying movies. For those of you who have read the book, it's split exactly where you'd imagine it is, at a point where this half can totally stand alone as its own complete story. This was a wise move on the part of director Andy Muschietti because this book is virtually impossible to adapt faithfully, although a very solid attempt was made in 1990 as a TV miniseries, although even though it could stretch out over four hours, there were still budgetary and content restraints. And that content, look, make no bones about it, this is a hard R-rated epic adventure story involving kids in almost constant peril, and it very rarely pulls its punches, and never in a way that anyone who hasn't read the books would even notice. In every way, this is a film that prioritizes chills over all else, even plot momentum. But if there's one thing you can be sure of, it's that this version of it has teeth. A lot of them. Now, do you remember when I said that the book was virtually impossible to adapt faithfully? Well, the reason for that is partially because the story is so vast. In its scope, there are seven main protagonists. That's seven kids with their own unique personality traits, their own fears, and their own relationship towards it, the malevolent entity that feeds on fear and most often takes the shape of a murderous clown, Pennywise. That's seven whole sequences that you have to set up where a kid has an individualized solo experience in abject terror. Seven scenes that must begin, build, and then crescendo. To say nothing of the scenes in which the Losers Club, as they are called once they all get together, must face off with it as a group. That is a lot of screen time, and the middle section of the film does really seem like a non-stop parade of scare scenes that are all effective, but don't do anything to move the plot along. The movie does hammer away at your nerves in the most delightful way, though, and those seeking armchair-clenching fun will definitely find themselves exhausted by the end. And we should talk about how effectively Bill Skarsgård creates a newer, more terrifying take on the character, similar to what Heath Ledger did with the Joker. Look, bottom line, this dude is creepy, man. I mean, he is one scary mofo. And the pictures, the pictures here, they don't even do him justice. This, this Pennywise is a boogeyman for the ages. I tell you, this movie is so damn good, people. It does everything right. The casting of these kids, they're all so great. The cinematography, the editing, the creature design. There's also a suitably rich musical score by Benjamin Wallfish that literally strikes the perfect perfect tone for each scene. This thing looks great, it sounds great, and when the kids make their stand against evil, it's not just terrifying, although it certainly is that. It's, it's inspiring. This isn't simply a genre film. It is legitimate cinema, populist art of the highest order. Both Stephen King and Steven Spielberg would definitely be proud. The only thing I would wish for would be more of it. Even if it only tells half the novel's story, even if it cuts straight to the thrilling chase every chance it can get, and even if the final product still runs at two hours and 15 minutes long, I still say there's not enough of it. Certain characters or themes are less fleshed out than others, and the story could have used more detail, more room to breathe. There are some hard truths about the town of Derry, and especially the town's adults, that are implied because they can only be implied. Certain symbols and motifs, like the fact that turtle imagery keeps popping up, that are blatant in the book, which was super thick at over a thousand pages, that are simply lost here. And certain narrative through lines that are explained with a mere line of dialogue. Because there simply wasn't time, and there was no point in cutting any of the scares to make room for that elaboration. However, they are still there, as service to the fans, in the margins if you're looking for them, and book readers certainly will be. What we're left with then is a masterpiece, although it feels like a condensed one, with a narrative that gets the job done at the end of the day, and whose changes to the source material are almost all pretty innovative. I award it an extra large bag of popcorn for being a relentless, rich, 
funny, thrilling, and transporting cinematic experience. It's the adaptation I didn't even know that I had been waiting for. It makes a familiar story fresh and visceral, and it creates feelings and images that will haunt you for days afterwards. I can't wait to see it for a second time, and I'm looking forward to seeing this story brought to its conclusion by the same crew as soon as possible. That does it for this edition of Movies That Pop. Don't forget to follow me, the Colonel, on Twitter at Movies That Pop, and click the icon right down there to visit our channel if you'd like to see more, and so Support us by clicking subscribe while you're there and by clicking the thumbs up icon below. I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Did you like it? Did you see it? In the meantime, thanks for watching. I'm the Colonel, and we all float down here.